welcome to uh, Christmas Eve and uh, opportunity to, to gather together to remember our Lord Jesus and to remember the work he did on our behalf. And this is uh, a good thing, a joyful thing. And uh, just uh, we come together joyfully and happily. And I want to start off with uh, Jesse singing, Oh Come All Ye Faithful. Jesse, and uh, well, the center of all this is the, the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2, and uh, Gideon Hartig is going to come and, and read this for us. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was the governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to, marry, to be married with him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there is no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, I bring good news that will cause a great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior is born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby, or find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth on, the home, on those whom his favor rests. 
When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning that what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But, ma but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. It's <laughs> a big breath there. <laughs> well, we, uh, as we have the story uh, written, uh, read to us there, uh, two parts of it certainly that uh, express things that are going on. The first part of it is this traveling to where uh, Bethlehem, where they needed to be, and and uh, the birth time, and just uh, some songs to reflect upon that. Would you join us as we sing Bethlehem, and then Silent Night?
silent night, holy night. All is calm, all is bright. So again, two elements of this story here. We have the first part with Joseph and Mary as they come and they come to Bethlehem and no room in the inn for them, but they, they find a place. She gives birth and, and the, the child is laid on the manger and uh, there's quietness there. But then as the scene shifts, what happens? We have shepherds in the fields nearby. In that area around Bethlehem, there would have been the place where, well, they would have, they would have raised many of the sheep that would have been used in Jerusalem, just a, a six miles or so away from Jerusalem, where they would have had sacrifices. And people would need to have an, some kind of animal to, to take for the sacrifice. And so shepherds would have been in that area raising their sheep. And, and as they stood out there, <laughs> Oh, what a cacophony of things happens. The angel of the Lord comes and, uh, and appears to them. Then the glory of the Lord shone around them. What a sight that might have, must have been. Um, as the, uh, the next song just reflects that, and that's uh, Angels We Have Heard on High. And just uh, even seated, uh, let's, uh, let's sing Angels We Have Heard on High. <laughs>
Now I'd like to invite the Marissa and Abigail and Amelia up to, they're going to sing for us the first Noel. Thank you, Marisa and Amelia and Abigail. (coughs) 
Well, as I think about this story and just all the implications that it has for what we do and, and what we look at here, um, it's, it's filled with so much. And um, one of, the, uh, one of the, the great expressions of this is, uh, again, the two parts of the story. There's the silent part, and then that comes that second part where, where the angel shows up. And the glory of the Lord shones around them. And uh, that's quite a word there. In, in, the, in, the, in the Greek, uh, uh, it has elements of brilliance and, and shining and, and just uh, something that is uh, splendorous to look at. And, and yet this word also has connections in the Old Testament as well and, and gives great descriptions of that. In fact, there's a, there's a scene that, that talks particularly about this in, in the book of the Exodus and in chapter 33. And it's a time where Moses was is hanging out with God and he's talking with him and, and they're having uh, just a relationship with one another and, and God is show, showing him and telling him about what's important about him and he has a request that he wants to have. He wants to see his glory uh, and this is what it says in Exodus chapter 33. Um, uh, Moses said to the Lord, you, you have been telling me uh, lead these people, you have, but you have not led, let me know who, whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. And then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Uh, the story in the Old Testament gives a perspective on, on the glory of God and that the glory of God, well, it's nothing to be trifled with. And in the presence of the glory of God, the response generally and always is, well, abject terror <laughs> and facing this God's presence is something more than people can handle. Isaiah in chapter 6 gets a vision. He has a vision. It's not even this er interaction that, that Moses is having. But in this vision, he sees God seated on a throne. And, he's, and as he looks at him, he says, woe is me. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and I live in among a people of unclean lips. Uh, the very presence of God is overwhelming to him. And so the sense, sense of God and his being near us is, well, it's always something that's, well, it, it gets your attention, that's for sure. We've seen in our stories throughout this month, looking at different parts of the story of Jesus' birth in the Gospel of Luke, uh, our passage here is the third appearance of an angel. An angel who comes into the presence of humans. And in this particular case, it comes to the shepherds after Jesus has been born to make this announcement. And as the angel appears, it says, the glory of the Lord shone around them. What a sight that must have been for them. Uh, the angel then says, them, do not be afraid. Too late. Because the presence of God is something beyond us. It's something beyond even that which we can really understand. The, the notion of who God is, 
my brother-in-law, uh, Scott Douglas, who is uh, just a, a brilliant guy. He, he has uh, multiple degrees. Uh, cellular biology, theology, and comparative literature are kind of the things that's a pretty wide swath of stuff. But as he reflects upon life, and he was, he was doing his doctoral th th um, dissertation, he, he brought to bear his comparative literature and his theology to consider this idea of well, how we communicate things, and particularly how we communicate who God is. And as, as part of that, he looked at a, a group of people called the Cappadocian Fathers. These are really old dead guys who lived in the 300s, but they had significant portions of, of, of statements and influence on what it is that we believe. Uh, many of you are familiar with something called the, the Nicene Creed and the Creed of Nicaea. These guys were instrumental in bringing a together these words to express this is what we believe. And one of the things that they wrestled with again and again in that time is how do we with words express who God is? It's an impossible task on some great level because God is so far above us. It's, it's, it's beyond what we can do and what we can do. And, and so, so Scott's book uh, is called The Theology of the Gap. And the gap being that, that, that difference between who God is and what we can express about God. He is so unknowable. He starts his book off with a quote from, from Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, again, one of these old dead guys. And, and that quote uh, begins by indicating uh, there is nothing in all of God's revelation, entire revelation, that teaches about the essence of God. Did you ever think about that? Nothing in all of Scripture tells us about this is the essence of what God is. This is how you can define him. And the reason is we don't have the words. We can't even find the concepts for that, much less the words to describe it. And so how does God come and show us and teach us and indicate to us who we are and who he is and what life is all about? Well, he, he does that through stories and through interactions Stories just like this one, as we have received it from the gospel writers, in this case, Luke. And as he brings this story to us, he gives us this picture of, of in frailty, this, this child coming in, in uncertain circumstances, unable to find any place to, to stay overnight. They are in a, a barn or a cave, somewhere where animals reside, certainly. And the child is laying in a manger. But when the announcement goes out to the shepherds, the glory of the Lord shines upon. The glory of the Lord comes down and, and, and directs them to, well, this is what's happening. This is what's transpiring around it. Don't be afraid because I'm bringing you good news. It causes great joy for all the people. There was an announcement of what God was about to do. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is Messiah. And then, <laughs> if, if, if it wasn't enough for the one angel, which indicates that the glory of the Lord shone around them, a whole host uh, appeared before them. And they were praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on, peace, on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. This is what came to them. What might they have been going through and experiencing in those moments? Can you imagine? I don't think we can. It's beyond anything that we can grasp hold of. But yet here we have this story of, of their experience and what they saw when they were out in those fields. But then when they went down into, into the town, and so they said to other, each other, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord is told about. And so they heard it off, and they, they saw Mary and Joseph, and they saw the child, and when they, they saw them, they couldn't contain themselves. They're spreading the news wherever they go, look at this, this is great, this is amazing, this is fantastic. And, and uh, they take off, and Mary treasures these things in their heart, but they're still, they're, they're glorifying God. This is awesome, this is amazing. We, I can't believe this, the excitement, the exuberance 
of what they encountered that day. And for us, we got their story. We got what they received and, and what they went through as they, they saw what God was doing. The announcement for them with, a, with a, 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 a Jewish background would have understood all that it meant about Messiah, that rescue and, and help is going to happen on their way, that the promises that God has made were going to be fulfilled. And this is awe-inspiring. It brings them to places where uh, they just are, are welling up and telling others, you got to see this thing. This is happening now. God at work in their midst, filling them, well, filling them with awe. We have two uses of awe in our, in our language. We have the word awesome and awe and things that's like, that's amazing. And we have things that are awful, uh, which has a different connotation altogether. Uh, things that fill us with awe but are terrible. And uh, both senses of the word of awe fit in there because when we encounter great but horrible things, it fills us with awe. But all of that gears and directs us to center ourselves and orient ourselves to God himself. And so this story that Gideon read, one we come to every year at this time, to be reminded God is, God came, and this child who was born this day lived and taught about the kingdom of God. And in the process of teaching about the kingdom of God, he was arrested and killed. And yet that wasn't the end of the story either. Because having died on the third day, he rose again. And all of this as well to fulfill scriptures and prophecies that God had said, this is what I'm going to do. That this one will take your place. We all like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. A lamb sacrificed for us. That's all included in this wider message of what God is doing. Again, we don't have teaching on who God is specifically in his essence. All we have are the interactions he gives us through scriptures about this is what I'm about, this is what's on my heart, and this is what I want for you. And this is what I'm providing for you. Uh, it reminds me a, a bit of a story. This is a story written by Nancy Dahlberg. And she writes, it was Sunday, Christmas. Our family had spent the holidays in San Francisco with my husband's parents. But in order for us to be back at work on Monday, we found ourselves driving the 400 miles back home to Los Angeles on Christmas Day. We stopped for lunch in King City. The restaurant was nearly empty. We were the only family, and ours were the only children. I heard Eric, my one-year-old, squeal with glee. Hi there. Hi there. He pounded his fat baby hands whack, whack on the metal high chair tray. His face was alive with excitement, eyes wide, gums bared, and a toothless grin. He wriggled and chirped and giggled, and then I saw the source of his merriment. And my eyes could not take it all in at once. A tattered rag of a coat, obviously bought by someone else eons ago. Dirty, greasy and worn, baggy pants, spindly body, toes that poked out of would-be shoes, a shirt that had ring around the collar all over, and a face like none other, gums as bare as Eric's. Hi there, baby. Hi there, big boy. I see you, baby. My husband and I exchanged a look that was a cross between what do we do and poor devil. Our meal came, and, and the cacophony continued. Now the old bum was shouting from across the room, do you know patty cake? Attaboy, do you know peekaboo? Hey, look, he knows peekaboo. 
Eric continued to answer and laugh, and hi there, every call was echoed. Nobody thought it was cute. <laughs> the guy was a drunk and a disturbance. I was embarrassed. My husband, Dennis, was humiliated. Even our six-year-old said, why is that man talking so loud? Well, Dennis went to pay the check, imploring me to get Eric and meet him in the parking lot. Lord, just get me out of here before he speaks to me or Eric. I bolted for the door. It soon was obvious that, that both the Lord and Eric had other plans. As I drew closer to the man, I, I turned my back, walking to sidestep him and any air he might be breathing. And as I did so, Eric, with his eyes riveted on his new friend, leaned far over my arm, reaching with both his hands in a baby's pick-me-up position. In a split second of balancing my baby and turning to counter his weight, I came eye to eye with the old man. Eric was lunging for him, arms spread wide. The bum's eyes both asked and implored, would you let me hold your baby? There was no need for me to answer because Eric propelled himself from my arms into the man's. Suddenly a very old man and a very young baby consummated their love relationship. Eric laid his tiny head upon the man's ragged shoulder. The man's eyes closed and I saw tears hover beneath his lashes. His aged hands full of grime and pain and hard labor, gently, so gently, cradled my baby's bottom and stroked his back. I stood awestruck. The old man rocked and cradled Eric in his arms for a moment, and then his eyes opened and set squarely on mine. He said in a firm, commanding voice, you take care of this baby. Somehow I, I managed, I will, from a throat that contained a stone. He pried Eric from his chest, unwillingly, longingly, as though he were in pain. I held my eyes open, my, my arms open to receive my baby, and again the gentleman addressed me. God bless you, ma'am. You've given me my Christmas gift. I said nothing more than a, a muttered thanks. With Eric back in my arms, I ran for the car. Dennis wondered why I was crying and holding Eric so tightly, and why I was saying, my God, my God, forgive me, forgive me. We don't have pictures or descriptions of God. We're not given that. We're given stories. In the scriptures, God interacts with people. He interacts with Moses and says, hey bud, I'm too much, you can't handle me, but I can show you something. You can see me as I go by. For Zechariah in, in Luke 1, fearful in the presence of an angel inside the temple. Mary come with a, uh, an angel coming to him saying, favored are you, Mary full of grace. And these shepherds and this picture of glory which speaks to something much larger than ourselves, bigger than us, uh, when we come here, what do we do? What is our point? Andy Diller in her, in her books, Teaching Stones to, to Talk, says, you know, if, if we had any sense at all, we would come to worship service with helmets on because we're dealing with big things here with a God who is much larger than we can imagine, who extends to us his goodness, his grace, even in the midst of his awesome and awful glory. And what are we to do? What can we do? Well, nothing but to turn around and recognize him and who he is 
to worship and glorify the Lord, to lift up our hearts to him in prayers and in songs, sometimes shouting and yelling, sometimes quietly meditating face down before him. God, his existence, his presence. It's about experiencing, knowing, and trusting in him and turning around and lifting him up. I want to finish with a, well, it wouldn't be a traditional Christmas song, but it certainly is filled with all the right things about orienting ourselves to God and who he is. Uh, I stand in awe. Will you stand as we sing? You are beautiful beyond description. Lord, in the now quietness of this moment, who you are, your glory shines in this world in ways that sometimes we don't see, and yet in our lives in ways that many times blows us away. And yet, Lord, we also come to times where we just come and go through the motions. But Lord, we, we come to this night and ask that your spirit would continue to guide, that you would fill us, and that we would be able to, to recognize your awesome glory is all around us. That our capacity to, to manage our lives is oftentimes futile. And yet, in all the things we've done and the failures that have been our lives, this story enters into it. That you care for us, that you love us. You demonstrate your own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You went through all this, all the things that happened, the, the, the running from Herod and then going to Egypt and then to Nazareth and, and all that sought to destroy you, you went through that because we matter to you. You love us. And while your glory is incomprehensible beyond the stars that go billions and billions of miles away, we are so small. We are microscopic. 
but you, the God of all this universe, know us, love us, and call us to come to you and your glory. A glory revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ and given to us through him that we may live out of that. And as we live out of that at Christmas time and Easter and the rest of this year, we live out your love for all mankind, seeking and calling them to know you, your love, your call for forgiveness, restoration, and life. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're doing around us and that we may see you and know you in however small a way it is. We thank you that you have broken through to us through these stories you've given. And as we live these stories out ourselves, may we also be a part of you telling your story to others. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Merry Christmas.